and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. That sufficiency that we have is from Christ. That's where we get that sufficiency from, that we're able to serve God faithfully. That's where our any righteousness we have comes from Christ and what He done, not with us. There's a lot of people, and I'm going to read about a people that had that mindset about their sufficiency was in the wrong place. Even though they were talking with Christ, they literally could physically talk with Him, they thought and their sufficiency was in their lineage of where they come from. And a lot of times people will think that. They'll think, well, my mom and dad, they were Christians, or my family is, so I'm okay. No, that's not the case. Our, our sufficiency, our assurance comes from God specifically to each and every one of us that obeys what God says. And we have to make sure that we rest in Him, not in assurance of what someone else thinks. There's a lot of thoughts and Many times we'll hear different thoughts on where our sufficiency or assurance lies, and we should let those thoughts be tested against the Scripture, and if they don't hold to it, they should just fall away, literally, figuratively, in every sense of the word. Because ultimately we're going to be judged out of things written in these Scriptures and based on the things, how we've conducted our life. Did we accept what God said, accept what Christ done, or did we say, nah, I don't want to do that? You know, I... Once, and it wasn't too long ago, I was in a, a Bible study and a man was talking about, he was talking to an individual and this really just cuts you deep when you hear something like this. There was a man, his son never become a Christian. His son never become a Christian. And he was talking to him about it and he said, you know, the dad said, you know, I don't want to become a Christian because I want to spend eternity with my son in hell. And that was one of the saddest things I've ever heard. It was one of the saddest things that I've ever heard that someone would take that position. That man's son, I don't know these individuals personally, so I'm taking the word of someone else who's talking with me about this in that study. If that man, if his son could talk to his dad, would tell him not to come to that place. Don't come to that awful place. Don't come there. Rest with your assurance in Christ. Now, I don't know if this man was just hurting so bad at the time he made such a comment because... That is such beyond comprehension for someone to say that. It's just hard to believe someone would truly want to take that path. They truly want to be there. In Proverbs chapter 3, in verse 5, it says this, and this is a lot of times where we run into trouble at, is because we don't follow this advice. Proverbs 3, chapter 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. See, what happens is we lean on our own understanding. That man, that gentleman I was just talking about that I was, we were discussing and I was told about, he was leaning on his own understanding. To truly understand what happens when you leave this life outside of Christ is so terrible. It's so it's so. It's so despite you have so much despair that it's hard to wrap our English words around because it is the total absence of anything good. Besides the physical, besides the torment, it is no good. There is no hope. There is no love. There is no light. There is nothing but despair and torment. And it's this. This is why we as human beings fall short because we trust in ourselves and we do not lean on the Lord for understanding. If we did, then everything we would do, all of our things we say, and all of us have to do this from time to time. I've never met a person yet that doesn't need to do this sometimes. Sometimes people are better at this than other people. At, from time to time, we have to watch what we think and to wonder and the things that we say and to make sure it lines up with the Scripture because if we did that, we're not going to say anything that we should we're going to do everything as we should. But sometimes we have to back up and we have to realize that some things that have influenced us are not for our benefit. 
to offer a benefit in our life in any capacity in this life or the next. We'll replace our assurance. A lot of times, and I'm going to go over to Matthew chapter 3, a lot of times people will base earthly thought processes on scriptural topics, and they shouldn't. And when they realize what they're doing, they have to back up, and they should, and say, you know, I was wrong, and I need to correct this. But in Matthew chapter 3, it starts at verse 7, it says this, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees came to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, this is the people I was referring to a moment ago, when we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. The earthly, the earthly lineage of thinking that I am of a lineage, and if you could trace your lineage back, I know I couldn't. If you could trace your lineage back that far and say, I'm a direct lineage descendant of Abraham, that would not get you into heaven. That would not. We have to be in Christ. Our assurance is in Christ. Some of these individuals here, no doubt, could trace their lineage back and say, I'm directly from this lineage. I'm from these tribes. I'm from here. Well, I can't, like I said, I can't do that. A lot of times our records go back to maybe you can find yourself in England. Our family's traced all the way back to England and those places there. But what would it matter? What would it matter if I, had, if I could trace my lineage all the way back? We had perfect records all the way back to Adam. I could go all the way back to Adam and say, see, I can trace all my lineage down. I know exactly where every single person in my family was, who they're related to, how they're related. Big deal. Big deal. Does people have interest in that? Sure, it's interesting. I think it's interesting too. But as far as Christ, as far as our assurance, it makes no difference. I want my lineage in, I want my assurance in Christ. I want that blood from Christ. I want to be, I have that blood applied to my life that my assurance is in Him. Not of my sufficiency, but of His. Not of my strength, but of His. Not of anything I could do that would even be considered good, but of His. In Acts chapter 10, in verse 34, beginning, And Peter said unto him, In a nice, Christ, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately, and all that dwelt in Linda and Sauron saw him and turned to the Lord. That is what we should look for. And Peter said unto him, Look here what he said. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Who made, he, who made him whole? Well, it was Christ. Who makes you whole? Who, who takes away that sin? It is Christ. Therefore, we have no way to hope in ourselves that we can say, I'm so good, or I've done these things, or I'm ever able to meet these things. I'm able to meet God's, God's standard, and you talk about a standard. I'm able to meet that standard, I'm okay. I could never meet that standard. I could never, ever meet that standard. It is not possible for me to meet that standard. Christ is who we turn to. That's how we get that standard. That's where we get that assurance. See, God is no respecter of persons. I was reading, I said, I may have said Acts chapter 10. I was reading Acts chapter 9, but I'm going to turn over now to Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, a person that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. God is no respecter of persons in that someone could say, because of my lineage, I want to be okay. Or because of who I am, I'm going to be okay. No, if I'm in Christ and abide in Christ, I have hope. That's where I have hope. Only in Christ do I have hope. If I were to keep everything, just like the rich young ruler, comes to Christ and say, you what you know all these things to do. Have you kept these things? And I'm paraphrasing here. And he says, I've kept all these things. If I had kept all those things, then I would be willing to accept Christ at that point. If I don't, no matter how good I think I am, no matter how much I want to keep these things, I fall short because Christ is the way. He's the door. He's how we get in. He's our assurance. He's the only assurance that I have. He is it. If all I know is Christ, 
if I am someone that my mental capacity only comes to the point that I know Christ, I know what He's done, that is enough. That is enough. You know, there's people that have different levels of mental capacity. Some people are extremely articulate. Some people have a great deal of intellect. They know great amounts, swaths of information. Well, they're no better off as far as salvation than someone who knows very little but understands what Christ said. They are equal in that respect. As a matter of fact, in Genesis, I turned over Genesis chapter 4 in verse 7. I just want to read this real quick for you. If thou dost well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now this was talking, this was the Lord talking to Cain, understanding that if you done well, aren't you accepted? And if you do sin, it look what happens. This is what happened. If you do not do well, sin lieth at the door. You have two paths that you choose. Just like today, we have two paths that we choose, either Christ or the world. Either sin or sanctification. We have two paths. We have two paths. We either choose one or the other. I'm going to turn over to Psalms chapter 9. I'm going to read verse 9 for you really quick. Psalm chapter 9, verse 9. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in troubled times. It's something similar if we go over to Psalm chapter 18. Psalms chapter 18 and verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. You know, when we think about the Lord being a refuge, God being a refuge. You think about this. It's just like if I were inside a castle or I was inside a domain or I'm inside a house and I know that my fortifications, whatever they may be, are so strong that when the enemy tries to get in, he can't. Then I sit steadfast. My assurance is in the right place. In the same regard is just like when we trust in God. I know, I know and I have assurance that God is able to do what? All things. He's able to help me. He's able to strengthen me. He's able to keep me. He's able to hold me. My salvation isn't in mistrust. It is in the right place if it's in God. So when the enemy tries to break through, I can sit back and say, well, God is there. He's going to help me through it. I don't know what the enemy's going to do outside my the fortress. I don't know what he's going to do, and I don't really care because I have that fortification that he is not able to break through. He's not able to take my salvation. It is impossible for him to take that salvation if I have my trust in the Lord, if I keep what God says, if I make sure I don't let in things. See, the world tries to do this. The world will try to do this. Watch this. The world tries to do this. I've got something for you. Open the door. I've got something. You're going to love it. God says, don't open the door. It's locked for a reason. Keep it out. Don't let it in. I have assurance that I have what I need in here. I don't need that out there. My assurance is in here. My assurance is in the Lord. And I'm going to trust in Him. I'm not going to trust in the unknown voice outside there that's trying to lead me out, trying to pull me out, tries to open the door, tries to jerk me outside, tries to get my hand a little dirty. No, I'm not going to listen to that. In Mark chapter 13, if you want to turn over there with me, Mark chapter 13 and verse 9 beginning. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you to councils. And in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak. Neither do ye premeditate, but whosoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now you talk about something to think about. Think about what's being said here. What's being said here. That when they were taken, when they were going to be delivered up, when, they were going to, when they're going to be taken before rulers and all these different individuals, don't take any thought 
for what you're going to say. That's resting in the Lord. That's resting in the Lord that what He says will come to pass. You know, a lot of times people will trust on their... We walk outside, we expect their vehicle to start. We trust in that fact. Do we trust in even more so when God says something, it's going to come to pass. If we do, that's where our assurance lies. That's where our assurance is at if we trust what God says. And it is evident in how we interact and what we do. And if we try to take the gospel, those are lost. And God knows in our heart if what we're saying, if we believe what we're saying. And you know, a lot of times, a lot of times people can read an individual and they can tell if you are sincere about what you're saying and do you believe what you're saying. That has a significant impact. A significant impact on the hearer is the person speaking. Do they believe it as well? In Matthew chapter 19, and what do we do? What do we do when times come, when things try to shake our faith? We pray. We pray for strength, and we have faith in God. In Matthew chapter 19, and verse 24, And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All things. We're able to accomplish all things. You think about the scripture. You think about how the gospel went out. You think about, and there was different times, there was different times different amounts of disciples that were with Christ. You know, when you read that, you'll see there's different amounts. I'm not talking about apostles. I'm talking about disciples. Different amount of followers with Christ at different times. And you think about what an impact, if we just were to think about someone just speaking the gospel, what an impact that had on people's lives and how far-reaching that has went. It has amazed me to see brethren in so many far-flung countries spread the gospel and what an impact it has there. When we are when we are faithful to God, when we are taking His Word out and sowing that seed, it has an immense impact on the world. It is truth. It is truth. It is has such impact on people when they hear truth. You know, a lot of times there's people that will try to deceive us. There's people that will try to spread lies. There's people that will try to do all kinds of things. Sometimes people give an ear to it. But have you ever listened to something and knew it was true and you just, it stuck to you? You couldn't help. You couldn't help but just listen. When God's Word, when it is heard, there's only two states that someone is in. Either they're going to adhere to hearing truth or they're going to try to block it out. We understand what God's Word is. We understand the truth. We understand when we hear this, what an impact it has. How has it changed you? How has it changed you? I'm a totally different person, I can tell you. I'm a totally different individual. I'm a completely different person. It completely changed me. Becoming a Christian totally took me in a 180 degrees turn. What I thought, how I interact, how I care about people is totally different. It totally changes you completely. You are truly a different individual. You are not the same person. It is a complete transformation. Now sometimes, and I'll be the first to admit this, it takes time. It takes time. Not everything I know now did I know when I first became a Christian. There's a lot that I did not know that I had to learn that I had to be willing to change. And that's something we have to all take time for is having that willingness to change. You know, if you were to turn over to Exodus chapter 14, and we were to look at what happened with the children of Israel, we were to look at how that when they were fleeing from the Egyptians, how that they were in such a dire situation, they were in such a dire situation thinking about how that they were being chased by the Egyptian army. And it's in Exodus chapter 14. We can start our way back into verse 9. I'll read just a little bit here. 
But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pithroth before Baal-Zephar. This is, when we think about this, and I've talked about this in the past, how that you think about the Egyptian army. This army is a very powerful army. It's not just a band of individuals that come together. Maybe you could look at like a just a group. No, this is a very powerful army. This would be like, and I can equivalent in my mind thinking about how powerful the Egyptian army was at the time, this is like the U.S. Army coming after you. That's what it would be like. And these children of Israel, they're very, very afraid at this point. Now, God delivered them. God delivered them so much so that they walked on dry ground where there was water before because it says they were in a, basically they're in a rock and a hard place because you got the Egyptian army here, you got the sea there. Where are you going to go? You know what an, an army will do for a group of individuals? They'll surround them. That's what will happen. They'll surround them and then they'll crush them. They're on chariots, they're on horses. When they, you know what happens when a cavalry charge goes to a man, goes to a group of men? It's like a steamroller. It absolutely destroys them. It crushes them. So you see this. These people see this coming. Well, they look here and there's, there's a sea. Where am I going to go? Well, God delivered them. God completely delivered them and totally destroyed the enemy. The same thing happens today. We, as a people, as human beings... We look at this and we see a sea of sin and we see death coming. And that's what was going on. The death was coming. That's what was going on with these Israelites here. Death was coming. That's what was coming toward them. This is death. Here's a sea. Just like today we have a sea of sin. Where are we going to go? Christ delivers us, destroys that, gives us a path. We know the way. There's a way. There's a way that leadeth unto destruction. It's wide. There's a path, a narrow path that we must walk. Well, that's what they did. They walked all the way through on dry ground. That didn't affect them anymore. That's what happens today. That's exactly what happens today if we obey what God says, if we're willing to get rid of that sin, that sin that holds us back. When death is charging on, and it happens to every single person in this life, it's charging on, it's getting closer, we can see it's getting closer, but we have salvation. We have assurance. If we go to Joshua, I want to go to Joshua chapter 1. I think about this at times. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither... Be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wheresoever thou goest. You know, Christ Christ told us the Comforter is going to come. If I go back, the Comforter is going to come. We're going to have comfort no matter. We, got that. we have a Comforter. We have one we can turn to in any situation that we do not have to be dismayed. Now, I know sometimes things come about that cause us to be very dismayed. There's problems in our life, things that happen with our spouses and those we love that causes us great distress, but we can always turn to Christ. He understands. We can pray to Him, and we can have comfort through those situations. Not that we won't have those situations come up in our life, but that we have a comforter. We have someone we can turn to. We can have someone who understands us in those situations that we can make it through it. We can have assurance. And Christ said it, it will come to pass. There is zero doubt in my mind that you will have, if you are a faithful Christian, that you will have that comfort if you turn to Christ. You will have comfort. If we go over to 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that, ye, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You know, it's not like the care that human has. It's not like the care that we have. You know, people can, it, no matter how much a lot of times we care about someone, someone can do something to us that causes us to be so, so distraught with them that we don't treat them like we would have otherwise. You know, Christ, He's there for us. 
He's there for us. He understands us more intimately than we ourselves understand ourselves. Sometimes we go through issues in our life and we think, how in this world did I end up here? How in this world can I get out of this now? Christ understands. He could lead us away from those things so that we were not in those things to begin with a lot of times. A lot of times we find ourselves in places that we ought not be, but we can turn to Him to lead us out of those situations too so that we're no longer in a situation that we would prefer not to be. But if we ever find ourselves in a situation where it is so difficult, it's so hard, it's not because we were out doing something we should not, then we just turn to Him for strength and we can instantly pray, instantly turn to Him for help. You ever been in a situation where you didn't think you could pray? You ever been in a situation where you're so distraught you didn't feel like you could pray? You didn't know the right words. You were so heartbroken. You were so beat down. That's what we have brothers and sisters in Christ for. That's what we have the ability to turn to them and say, please pray for me. I'm so heartbroken. I'm so distraught. I need your help. I don't, I don't even have the right words. Now, if we could utter just a little bit in prayer, God understands. But we have each other to turn to as well. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, it says this, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. Now you think about Abraham. Abraham didn't know, but by faith he moved. That sometimes is what we have to do. That is no different today than then. By faith, sometimes we have to move. By faith, I go out and I talk to people that are lost. By faith, I go out and I see, I know that God being with me can help me speak, can help me say those things, can help me go with those that are lost. I can't always see how someone can understand what the Scripture says, but by faith, I move. Same thing applies to everyone. By faith, we move. You know, a lot of times what holds people back from using the talents that they're blessed with is just simply through fear and not seeing how that that's going to accomplish something. It's not necessary for us to see. It's necessary for us to obey knowing that God is able while we are weak having assurance in Him that He is able to help us to work in Him. If we go to Philippians chapter 1. In verse 21. For to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If we live by that, then we're going to act like that. Seems simple. Seems simple, but how often do we fall short of that? A lot of times. A lot of times, just being honest as humanity, a lot of times we fall short of that. To live is Christ, and to think like that, and to die is gain. Looking to heaven beyond this life, looking to see what is above this earth, what is beyond this life. We think about how we are to live as Christ. If we are to live as Christ, then everything else is secondary. If we trust in God, then we don't rest our assurance in the world. Not that we don't have things that we are to do here in this life. There is many things we do here in this life. But we make sure that our trust is in Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to read verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my affirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, that's where we can, we can think about our feebleness, how wonderful it is that God has given us opportunities to serve Him and that in our weakness that His grace is sufficient for us, for His strength is made perfect in our weakness, that He's able to help us. You see, if we were a people that were so strong that we could just do whatever we wanted and we didn't need any help, what would happen? What would happen? Well, the first thing I'd do is look at it and say, you know, I was able to do it. I'm able to overcome. I'm able to do this. It was because of what I could do instead of looking to what Christ has done. See, we always look to Christ. We always look to Him. We always look to see what He has done and that it's His strength, not ours. It's never ours. 
It's never that we're able to do these things. None of this is ours. You think about the salvation that God has given to us. It wasn't ours. We didn't deserve it. We don't deserve it now. We never did deserve it. If we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I want to read this one last verse with you this evening. I mean this morning before I, before I go. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting well, we'll start at verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For we, for ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty men, not, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. That's key. God has chosen the weaker things and the base things of the world and these and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh, that's what I was alluding to a moment ago, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ, Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written he that glorieth glorieth, let him glory in the Lord not in ourself not what I can do not what you can do but what Christ can do that's where we glory that's where we lay our claim that's where we point other people to when someone says well you all and you've probably heard this many many times Christians hear this they say well you all just think you're so perfect. No, no, we don't. We don't. We think Christ is perfect. We think He is perfect. And we do our best to emulate ourselves after Him because we know He's the way and we fall short. He is perfect and we have sin in our life that needs forgiveness. And we know that someone else does too. Not that we would partake of the things of this world. The Scripture is very plain on that. Keep ourselves unspotted before the world to stay away from those sinful things. Yet we know that the sanctification comes through Christ. That is His blood that gives us a way to go to heaven. Not because of who we are, who we've been, our lineage, how good we think we are, what kind of deeds we can do, how much we can give. That's not it. It's through Christ. That's where our assurance lies. If there's anyone that's not a Christian, I would implore you to come forward. I implore you to obey this gospel. I'm going to read this for you real quick. It's in Romans 10, 17. It says this, So the faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews 11, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In Luke 13, 3, it says, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. In Romans 10, 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That is a guarantee. We have complete assurance in that, that if we live faithful unto death, we will receive a crown of life. Thank you for your times. We come together and sing.